When I first set out on this path, it was to become the ideal warrior of the nation I served so dearly. I served my nation, and my coordinator, to the best of my ability. Yet as time went on, I saw the graft, the corruption, the ineptitude of those I served, and those around me. Slowly but surely, I came to realize that if the nation I loved was truly to come into its destiny, I needed to take my own steps to ensure that it would happen. Gunji no Kanri, Toranaga, Masuhari. The Dark Age is a time which for many is ironically a blank space in their knowledge of the setting. It's not simply a Dark Age in the context of the times it covers, but for the fanbase for a multitude of reasons. One part is the MechWarrior Dark Age clicks game, and another part is more in line with some of the storylines which were chosen, initially at the start of the new era. Another stumbling issue is that for the novel series and many of the source books, the primary focus is always set on the Republic of the Sphere a faction which always found itself fumbling to find an audience, or the ability to attract much of the fanbase. Worse still, this means that many of the events outside of the Republic did not receive the attention they deserved during the development of the Dark Age. It also means that many do not understand just how important this lore is, not only to the current setting, but to the whole of Battletech. I for one think much of what happened outside of the Republic of the Sphere was fantastically handled during the Dark Age, even if it wasn't given the exposure it needed. The decline of House Steiner, the reunification of the Free Worlds League, the new Combine Sun War, there's just simply a plethora of ideas and plotlines that are of great importance. And in the case of the Draconis Combine, it has, perhaps, the best story of all. The peak of the broad strokes we received from the Dark Age comes from the Combine. It comes as a story of corruption, complacency, ambition, revitalization, and war. And in that, perhaps the greatest single figure to appear in the last century in the Inner Sphere emerged. Not as some infallible, ultimate conqueror, but as a patriotic man from nowhere who would shape the Combine and renew it for generations to come. The subject of this video is one Toranaga Masuhari, the greatest warlord the Combine has known for most of its history, and perhaps the only leader it ever had who can claim to have surpassed the accomplishments of Karita Theodore. And we will also be covering as well the context for the events around his journey. Ito Matsuhari was born on New Samarkand to a pair of middle-income parents in 3089. His parents were owners of a local glassblowing shop, which is an artisan craft and an honest one. He would have been destined, in all likelihood, for civilian life, either in the same field as his parents or elsewhere. It's clear he would have been gifted in some way in what he participated in, and probably would have had some success in any occupation he would have been brought into as he went into adulthood. But this is not the life Matsuhari would have the opportunity to live, as at the age of seven, he was orphaned when his parents died. Unable to be cared for by relatives, and uncared for by the social safety net, which would have presumably been limited on New Samarkand given its reputation. Masuhari was left to a life of pickpocketing in the city of Yamashiro. He would perfect this talent, and would eke out a survivable living as a child, abandoned by the world and by his parents through their passing. At age 10, however, Despite his efforts to the contrary, Masuhari would be apprehended by local authorities as a crackdown on petty criminal activities took place. 
He and a slew of other children living under these conditions. Conditions to be clear that would have been destined to create organized criminals later in life would be sent to a state home. But during these procedures, the young man caught the attention of a man named Toranaga Saburo, a retired Tai Sa from the Sword of Light. Saburo saw in Masuhari something, perhaps the spirit to survive at all costs, even through the hardship of tragedy. Instead of allowing the boy to fall into the state-run childcare system, he would intervene, using his status to adopt the boy into his care. We do not know much of Toranaga Suburo, beyond his name and rank, but we do know the values he instilled in Matsuhari. Suburo would pass on to his adopted son the code and tenets of Bushido, training him to hone his skills into the craft of the warrior, and to put him on the path of being a warrior first. This meant servitude and duty towards the state as well. In adopting Matsuhari, and his attempts to mold this one-time street urchin into a warrior, Saburo was following those values himself, repaying the society he served through his career by passing on his skills, craft, and teachings to a new generation, and one which would have otherwise been a burden on the state. He saved Masuhari from a life wasted, and gave it back to the Combine as a gift. The most personal thing that he would pass on to Masuhari is his name, honoring the child with his surname, Toranaga. His ward took much of the teachings to heart as well, and his adopted father's help would gain him entrance to the Sun Zhang Mech Warrior Academy. Sun Zhang is one of the premier military academies in the Combine, and is renowned for its strict measures, as well as its rigorous insistence on instruction and following the tenets of Bushido. Students only participate in the academy for a little under a year, and those who are found worthy will graduate their first course. All those who graduate are immediately placed into military service as a part of the Shonjang Academy cadres, where they serve a further tour until final graduation. 400 mech warriors are graduated every year and all students who meet this goal are not only rewarded with further service within the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery, but they are honored with a Daisho, a katana paired with a Wakashashi. Toranaga Matsuhari would pass through the academy and would do so with honors. He would see his first post on Genosha. His military career would begin against vicious enemies of the dragon overall facing off in several actions first against Clan Snowraven, and then the fearsome Clan Ghostbear. But these conflicts were little more than skirmishes. While personal honor and glory were to be had, these fights would fade from memory with time, and would be little more than a footnote. Toranaga viewed the Combine as always being under threat, and one of near total annihilation, from their greatest nemesis to the south the Federated Sons, and to a lesser extent that enemy's ally, the Republic of the Sphere. He viewed this as many did, and peered at the world around him through the traditionalist lens, and seeing this unfold did not bring honor to the dragon in his eyes. The Draconis Combine had gone through a transformation under Carita Theodore, which resulted in years of reforms within the military, but also significant reforms diplomatically. While there would always be some tension with the Combine and its neighbors, it was not as it had once been. The Karito royal family, in the years that followed, through Karito Horiro, and later Karita Vincent, would continue policies that largely put the Combine at peace with its neighbors in the Republic and the Federated Sons, despite some clawbacks by traditionalists. The military itself began to lose some of its teeth, even. The days of glory and conquest seemed settled. If anything, the Combine, despite hiding some of its armaments, had become cowed by the treaties which formed the Republic. A Republic which occupied many Combine worlds, and which still had Combine citizens or their descendants. In the same period of time, the Capelling Confederation under both Sun Tzu Lao and later his son Dao Shen Lao resisted this treatment from the Republic, and still fought for their empire's integrity. 
Toronaga was a swift, competent soldier and commander, and his actions fighting in border skirmishes with the Bears and the Ravens would earn him enough acclaim and enough accolades to ascend through the ranks of the DCMS. But his own views of the world would shift and change with his ascension through the ranks as he began to see the Combine for what it now was, compared to what it had been. I knew the task would be hard, and that I would need to go to great lengths to achieve it. My focus was absolute. I brooked no argument. I allowed nothing to dissuade me from my task. When the opportunity came to put my plans into motion, I acted in the truest sense of a warrior, with certainty, surety, and swiftness. I found Yuri, a woman with barely a name, and I used her blood to elevate her to the throne, allowing me the true opportunity I wanted. To serve. With Yuri on the throne, we could finally take our legacy to heart and ensure that the Federated Sons never threatened us again. By the 3120s, Toranaga, now in his 40s, had risen to the rank of Tai Shu, or Warlord, of the new Samarkand Military District. His political ambitions began to truly form at this time, as his restlessness and disappointment in the Coordinator and the corrupt system around him grew into a genuine hatred. Kalita Vincent came from everything, a noble background founded and managed by great warriors, wealth, education, and all the trappings of power. But this man was so weak that he could not properly defend the Combine, or preserve its territory or true independence. The only problem was that he was also very little different from anyone with immediate access to the throne. For Toranaga, this seemingly put an end to any ambitions he could have, until he discovered Sakamoto Yori and her family. They would be approached by Toranaga's representatives, as he was one of the most powerful figures now within the Combine, and they would be brought to New Samarkand, where Yori would be enrolled into the Gaeldon Military Academy, with the intention of teaching her the necessary skills to become a soldier and mech warrior. This was not done out of great generosity, though. Instead, the young girl would be Toranaga's vehicle for change. Her blood relation to Karita Theodore meant that she was in fact in line for the throne. Helping in raising her from age 11, Toranaga would mold her into his creature, much as Saburo perhaps molded Matsuhari into his creature. She was very much his student, as well as his plot against Karita Vincent. As this took place, however, it wasn't as if other factions or agents within the Draconis Combine weren't aware of Toranaga's flawed loyalty to the Coordinator. In 3129, they would act. On the world of Kuzunejoy, assassins would strike for the Warlord who appeared increasingly to be a threat to the current order within the Combine. But Toranaga was a man who had the respect of his soldiers, and he was a more than competent leader for them. The assassins, instead of succeeding, would be put down by Toranaga's guards, who were armed and equipped with Kishi battle armor. This enhanced the prestige of this particular suit of armor across the Combine, as it saved one of its most noteworthy and gifted commanders. Perhaps one thing which may have delayed the undoing of the royal family and their loyalists was the invasion of the Republic of the Sphere in what is called the Age of Destruction. During this brief period, the Republic began to lose near total control of its outer territories after the HPG blackout. Violence won the day as Separatists from every region of the Great Houses struck, attempting to divorce themselves from the enforced rule of the supposed Republic. Eventually, the Draconis Combine itself would intervene, invading in 3133 with its own forces rather than just supporting local militias with a veiled hand. 
and behind the scenes they enhanced their relationship with the Capellan Confederation, another belligerent. During this military intervention, Clan Novacat would be utilized, one of the former invading clans who now settled within the Draconis Combine. While this was viewed positively by the administration, it was not viewed positively, nor was the influence of the Novacats by others within the Combine, creating some political rifts between military districts. Diaron Military District, by the end of 3135, would be brought back into the Draconis Combine, or at least declared as such. The Federated Sons, an ally of the Republic on face value, would also turn on them, with Caleb Davian, the new First Prince, attacking their weakened ally to repatriate Federated Sons' worlds, and also putting their forces into the same theater as the Combine. In October of the same year, Exarch Joan Eleven would raise the Fortress Republic, protecting the core systems of the Republic and preventing outside faster-than-light travel, mostly from entering Republic space. The Combine and the Confederation would continue to gorge on the worlds outside of this protected core near their respective borders. But an upheaval was coming, at least within the Draconis Combine. In an attempt to push past the Wall, Carita Theodore II, Vincent's son and primary heir, someone who was seemingly far more aggressive and more in the mold of what many would have desired for the Combine's leadership, attempted to jump into the fortress. He was killed in the horrifying mishap that took place, immediately removing the heir of the Draconis Combine and beginning a political crisis. Toranaga saw this as his time to move, with Theodore dead, someone who he perhaps held less animosity for, or at the very least felt would be more difficult to remove. He would make a play at killing the other heir to the Combine throne, Karita Emi, who would be seemingly killed in a dropship accident. Karita Komi, the wife of Theodore, and who was pregnant with his heir, would be assassinated on March 15th. On the same day, before the news could reach Vincent, he and his last remaining son, one who could not inherit due to being medically unfit, would be killed in a bomb blast during a feast ironically celebrating Theodore's life and his soon-to-be-born heir. All of the strands were seemingly cut. Chaos would have begun to take root within the Combine itself had someone not been present as an alternative. And it just so happened that one such person was ready to seize the reins of power, with the incredibly powerful warlord of the new Samarkand district by her side. The latter would be the true power between the two, the true master of the realm, as he pulled every connection he had to not only assassinate the sitting coordinator and his family, but also to place Yori on the throne. The military would be in charge once more, and he would be made Gunji no Kanri, almost 18 months later, a power second only to the coordinator. But this coordinator, all new, sat only where she was because Toranaga placed her there, and was very much his puppet. Only the most blind and dim-witted could not see it. There were no other suitable candidates, at least publicly, and there were no other candidates so closely related to House Karita's main family line. Yori was seemingly the only option for succession, and Toranaga's game had been played well. Over 15 years of planning had finally been executed. This was his service to the dragon, a service which his adopted father taught him. The weak had been cut away, and the dragon would be made stronger for it. To Toranaga, this act wasn't born of arrogance, but was one of necessity. The dragon had nearly vanquished the Republic, and he had overseen their advances over the 18 months since the loss of the previous coordinator but he had another adversary yet to defeat. The Federated Sons were simply too much of a threat, and they would never cease being a threat, and it was a threat left to linger far too long by both Karita Hohiro and his son, Vincent. For all my sins, I at least should be honest with myself. I have many regrets, Julian Davian. 
Perhaps not the same ones you would have me feel. But I know full well that mistakes have been made, and that I will pay the price for them. Toronaga is a man who eyes his campaigns with long-term objectives, not needing any one victory to necessarily achieve all he needs. As demonstrated with his 15-year plot in order to usurp and weaken House Karita, he implemented the same approach to his military plans. There would be several steps in his approach to defeating and forcing a peace upon the Federated Sons. The Kanri was no fool, and knew the odds of annexing House Davian bordered on the impossible. What was possible, however, was to defeat their armies in the field, capturing vital worlds and resources, killing vital leadership, extending the Combine's border into Federated Sun space, and destabilizing their enemy until they had no choice but to ask for terms, and favorable terms, to the Draconis Combine. He would end the threat of the Federated Sons on the mighty Combine's border once and for all, and that would be his eternal gift to the state, which he had sworn his life to protect. To achieve this plan, Tornaga knew it would be foolish to only use his own forces, and the forces of his fellow warlords. There had to be additional outside assets who could share the burden without weakening the political balance within the Combine and he made a bold play, inviting the Wolstragoons to terms, seeking to hire the legendary mercenary unit to the cause of the Combine. This was unprecedented in many ways, given the long, vicious history between the two organizations. But things were not as they once were, and Toronaga was not Karita Takashi, or even Theodore. It was a new era in the Combine, and a new era meant new deals could be forged. The Dragoons themselves had been in a strange state since the word of Blake's attack on the Inner Sphere, nearly being destroyed in that moment. They would recover, but only with the help of the Kelhounds, Wolves in Exile, and the near-charity contracts from the Leering Commonwealth. There was a desperate wish to change from within the unit, which was filled with young talent looking for an opportunity for greater contracts and greater, newer adversaries than the former Free Worlds League and the formidable Jade Falcons. In 3139, much to the shock of the Inner Sphere as a whole, the ink would be set upon the contract between the Draconis Combine and the Wolf's Dragoons. With his own forces prepared, including the legendary Ryukin, a unit with a long history with the Wolf's Dragoons, Toronaga would press the attack to begin the vision he once had for the safety of the Draconis Combine, and sought to bring the Draconis Reach to heal. A nine-month campaign would follow, with the Dragoons doing most of the heavy work, smashing into the armed forces of the Federated Sons and rolling over most of the Reach, though they were given notable assistance from the Ryukin during the campaign. The first step of the plan completed, the Dragoons themselves would take up the initiative and began raiding into the Draconis marches, but it would become a quagmire for several months, before the Ryukin were deployed to help them withdraw from the conflict zone, pulling back to their latest conquests in the once contested zone. The Sandovals, the defenders of the territory beyond their borders, had proven themselves, or at least those under their command had proven themselves, to be quite able to fight the premier units of the Draconis Combine and the mercenaries they hired. This setback did not yield any punishment for those involved, as Toronaga knew better than to scold his mercenaries for taking up the initiative, even if the latter portion of the campaign proved wasteful. This mattered little in the long term, for the campaign by the Dragoons and the Ryukin had been the mask for his amassing of forces to prepare for what he had envisioned for so long, the invasion of the Federated Sons proper. Only this plan would be met with an unexpected backhand blow which Toronaga hadn't taken into account, disrupting not only his plans, but potentially upending the entirety of everything he had worked towards. Duke Sandoval saw the unraveling of the AFFS fighting along the Draconis Reach, and had seen the raids into his own territory, 
But the commander had the sense to not relax upon the fighting's end. He knew that their defeat would invite further aggression, and as such, the best plan was to strike back, and decisively, in order to either divert the dragon's resources, or repel it, forcing the beast back into its lair. He would beg for aid from his cousin, First Prince Caleb Davian, the descendant of the great Hans Davian. The First Prince, however, was disinterested in such an operation, and instead was focused on his doomed campaign against the Capellan Confederation. The First Prince, unfortunately for the Federated Sons, was quite aggressive, with dreams of glory, all while being a mediocre commander, as well as suffering from mental illness. This left Duke Sandoval very much on his own. Despite his close familial ties with the monarch of the realm, he would press every possible military-capable body into service in the realm, all while scraping together every ship and every battle mech he could find. Sandoval would not simply stand by as a potential threat lingered, and he would not leave the Draconis attack unanswered. Targeting a seemingly vulnerable point in the huge border between the two powers, in 3141 the Duke struck with the full might that his forces could bring to bear. Had the attack been expected, or even telegraphed prior, the Combine would have brushed it aside. One of Toranaga's and the Combine's greatest follies was not anticipating this counterattack, which tore into the unprepared defending units across the border near the worlds of Cassius and Barlow's folly. The blow's ferocity, and perhaps even the desperation behind it, saw the DCMS thrown back and overrun across a multitude of worlds in this impressive, Herculean effort by the Duke and his forces. The surprise assault could only work in their favor for so long, however. New units would be flooded into the combat theater to slow the Davian advance, and the Wolstergoons and Ryukin became anchors for the defense as the Federated Sun's forces were slowly bogged down, despite the fact that they had pushed into the Combine's territory proper. The breakthrough all the same could have resulted in a cataclysmic defeat for the Combine had it been supported by the central administration of the Federated Sons. And the Combine Command, as well as Toranaga, would have known this. Their greatest ally, ironically, was the First Prince himself, who seemed to care nothing for setbacks against the Combine, or even losses of territory in the Draconis Marches, despite his own family being linked to the Sandovals by this point through his mother. Duke Sandoval's pleading for more forces to exploit this breakthrough into Combine space were left unanswered as the forces of the Draconis March were pinned into place. Worse yet, despite the looming disaster now beginning to appear, Caleb spitefully withheld aid as it became more obviously needed, for he felt his cousin had overstepped his boundaries by launching a major offensive and defending his duchy during an active war with the Draconis Combine. The thrust which Corwin had stabbed into the belly of the dragon, which had been meant to be a decisive blow, became a grueling war of attrition as the dragon stumbled to react to the offensive, but all the same fought doggedly to hold the Sandoval forces in place. Unfortunately for the Combine, though perhaps fortunately for the reputation of the Kanri, one of the most pivotal shifts in history would take place as a result of this poorly mismanaged defense. It gave the perception of weakness from the new administration on Luthien and its military command. And there were other actors within the Combine who sought their own new political fortunes. And that is the way of it, isn't it? Tornaga's gaze returned to the foe window. A single warrior, placing his blood, his gold, and his sacred honor on the battlefield in service of a cause he felt was just. So a leader he felt was worth it could ascend to the throne. Even a throne he might have aspired to himself. One thing which had been done with swiftness and grace had been the removal of Coordinator Kurita Vincent and his family, 
Toronaga's scheme of having Kurita Yori prepared to step into the role of the coordinator, albeit as his puppet immediately after the death of the previous occupant and other claimants, had largely left the Combine in a state where others with political ambitions had little ability to pull against this coup. With time, and largely with success, especially against the Republic and then with the Draconis Reach, it cemented the Kanri's rule over the Combine, seemingly. This, however, was disrupted by the ill-handling of the response to the attack by Duke Sandoval. There had been others whose axe to grind was simply too large, and whom had gone out of their way, at all costs, to begin their own bid for power. Clan Novacat had been one of the primary antagonists to the Combine in the era of the clan invasion, partnering with the vile clan Smoke Jaguar in their attack on the territories of House Kadita. The two would also ally closely for the invasion of the Draconis Combine capital world, resulting in their mutual defeat in the climactic Battle of Luthien. Clan Novacat, however, would inevitably switch to supporting the Inner Sphere, and as time would go on, would settle within the borders of the Draconis Combine, swearing fealty on the surface as loyal new subjects to the Coordinator and the Five Pillars of Government within the successor state. The reality was, unfortunately for all those involved, not entirely what it seemed. The Novacats had been caged, in their own view, within the confines of their stated worlds and territories within the Combine. Their military forces were also used upon request, but the Novacats hardly viewed this as an honorable use of their forces. Fighting on behalf of the Combine had become tired, and they, much like Toranaga before, had been upset with the status quo. Only the Novacats sought for their own opportunity to gain power to break the bindings which held them. They would have their own puppet on the throne, and the Combine would work towards their own interests. And they would not only be free within the confines of the Combine's borders, but they would be its new masters. This was possible because Kirita Emi, the last remaining child of Kirita Vincent, had in truth not been killed in a dropship explosion or accident. In fact, in 3138, she gave birth to a male heir, Daisuke. She and her son had been sheltered by Clan Novacat, who would use her as a rallying cry when the time was right to depose the puppet Kirita Yori, as well as the true leader of the Combine, the Gunji no Kanri, Toronaga Masuhari. With so much of the Draconis Combine mustered soldiery busy within the former Republic, where ironically a great number of Novacat forces were embedded with them, and with the soldiery also being embroiled within a desperate, attrition-based fight Along the borders with the Federated Sons, the Novacats chose their moment to strike, led by Khan Nostra. The opening of the rebellion set the tone of the total destruction that was to come. Airisi, the capital of the Novacat Enclave, had a local garrison of Draconis Combine forces stationed there, as they had been for four decades. These forces were overwhelmed, and the entirety of them were executed by the Novacats. This act of rebellion was one of anger and euphoria, as well as for the Novacats an end to their humiliating servitude. They had raised the war banner. For Toranaga, this presented the ultimate threat to him and his regime. On the one side, he had the Federated Sons now fighting in a desperate battle within the Combine itself, something he'd always viewed as what he wanted to avoid at all costs for the Combine as a whole. And on the other side, he now had the realization of an insurrection against his rule, and the rule of his puppet, all due to not having his objectives confirmed. The Gunji no Kanri was at the lowest point of his ambitions, and the lowest point of his power. What was running through Toranaga's mind at this time? Was it a question of his ultimate failure? Perhaps of the realization of his folly? One can speculate, but inevitably it had to at least be somewhat grim. From this moment forward, however, the true ability for Toranaga to manage his political and military capabilities appeared, and this would be the crisis that separated him from being simply a man who took power, 
to being one of the most notable figures in the history of Battletech. The Novacats would continue their campaign, striking out against Xinyang in a less bloody affair, due to their leadership reigning in some of the more aggressive tendencies of their soldiers in hopes of luring more support from disaffected DCMS units from within Toranaga's regime. The former territories of the Republic fell to the Novacats almost immediately, and with little military opposition, especially as warlord Tormak Kitana swore herself to the clan effort to restore Emni to the throne, which took place on August 18th, 3141. Unfortunately for the Novacats, this new ally brought more baggage than they might have anticipated. Tormak was largely despised by many within the DCMS, especially among her fellow warlords, and the director of the ISF also held her in contempt as well. With her declaring for the Novacats, it unironically added more potential rivals than immediate allies for the clan effort to capture the state, but it did add a significant military district and a number of soldiers to the immediate cause of the Novacats, giving them more fighting ability. Between the Novacats and the Diaron district, these forces would hold the entirety of the former Republic worlds, all the way through to the planet of Benjamin, which meant that their entire rule consisted of dozens of systems, and gave the rebels an enormous anchor point against the rest of the Combine. The problem is, is Toronaga was wise enough to use this treachery to his own political advantage, which then cemented his grasp on the other warlords within the Combine. No more major defections would take place. The next great issue for the Rebels was that they hadn't realized that the bloody, violent battle against the Federated Sons had not involved the enormous reserves Toronaga had built up for the invasion of the Federated Sons. The Draconis Combine had not committed these troops into the meat grinder that was Duke Sandoval's quagmire, as Toronaga still had hopes for launching his offensive into the Federated Sons proper, once the counterattack had been brought to a complete halt. This lack of knowledge on the part of the Rebels can be laid at the feet of the HPG Blackout, and on the Novacats, as well as the Diaron Military District, not being informed of all of the plans and operations of the Federal Government as well as not being informed to the Kanri's plans and other military movements. Withdrawing a handful of units from the Federated Conflict, uniting them with his reserves, and gambling that the Ryukin and the Wolstergoons would be enough to hold back the Sandovals, Toranaga committed his reserves to a war which he was not intent on originally waging. The Novacats and their allies, much earlier, had avoided making large moves towards Luthien, in hopes of courting more allies to join Emmy's cause, and to prevent the military forces from within the Combine from siding with Toranaga. This meant that eventually, the liberation of Luthien would be done with the majority of the Combine under their command, or so was the plan, and that would legitimize their claim. The truth of the matter, however, was that most of the warlords within the Combine had already sided with Masuhari and their forces had been sucked into the reserve forces for the ultimate showdown with the Federated Sons. The blade which was forged to cut the Davians was thrust and cut towards the Novacats, with the entirety of the campaign being commanded at its head by Toranaga. In 3142, approximately a year after the insurrection had begun, attacks would be made towards Silene, Prasarpina, and Al-Nair, each one crashing into the rebel forces, using their superior numbers, well-trained troops, and the full might of the dragon's talons. The Novacats were immediately placed into a desperate situation with the realization that Toranaga's forces were more substantial than they had anticipated, and that most of the Loyalist forces were not tied down with the Federated Sons. Khan Nostra and her allies would make a desperate bid to change the fortunes of war, and abandon their Combine rebel cohorts in the Diaron military district, all while rebasing themselves to Erisi to make a major thrust towards the capital, as the Novacat homeworld was only a handful of jumps from Luthien. The problem was the reality of the situation. First, the counterattacks by Toranaga's reserve army had been costly to the rebels. Worst yet, 
the Novacats had taken additional losses in their withdrawal from their allies in Daron. Abandoning those allies in Daron also meant it had freed up significant forces from the reserve army to move to other theaters in the now three-front war by the Draconis Combine. But worst of all is that Toranaga was able to read the map in every way. He knew the disposition of his enemies. He knew the plays they had been making across the treacherous military district, and he knew now that they were desperate, especially as reports of the Novacats repositioning were coming to him. It became obvious that they would try to reform and rebase to try to decapitate the Loyalists, and the best place to attack in theory would have been Irisi. Whittled down to two galaxies, the Novacats realized that their gambit had failed before it even began, regardless of any assault they could wage. Nostra offered to resign in the face of her failed campaign, only to find that her clan council would not accept her resignation. The decision by the council had been made before she addressed them. Clan Novacat would fight for its freedom until the death. The final assault was declared to the remaining forces of Clan Novacat. But misfortune was already visiting them. Because before this doomed effort could even get off the ground, to engage in the second clan invasion of Luthien, the Loyalists, under the guidance of the Khanri, unleashed their own assault on the clan enclave. Clan Novacat forces on Leston, Avon, and Cyrenica had been defeated and killed to the last warrior, decimating what little remained of the Novacats. On December 23rd, 3142, the Draconis Combine would arrive in the Irisi system. Signals were sent displaying the Combine's victories and trophies over the other elements of the Novacat forces in an attempt to demoralize the defenders. This did not work, but they overwhelmed the last remnants of Alpha Galaxy upon their assault, crushing the Novacats within 48 hours of their landing on their homeworld. Khan Noster herself fought in a desperate last stand outside of their central genetic repository. Not only was she killed, as if to spit in her face, no efforts were made to capture the facility. It was destroyed by nuclear assault, annihilating the genetic legacy of Clan Novacat, and bringing an end to a 90-year clan occupation of the world, and the Novacat Enclave itself. No Inner Sphere house had ever managed to defeat and annihilate a clan on their own up until this time. Toranaga Masuhari and the brave, loyal soldiers of the DCMS under his command would achieve this feat. The death of Clan Novacat sent shockwaves through the Inner Sphere and presented a grim reality for the remaining rebels. Toromak Katana knew her own position would become increasingly unviable without her allies and she would participate in a fighting withdrawal over the course of the first two months of 3143. But it would be in vain. By the middle of February, they were crushed under the might of the Loyalist forces. With the majority of Tormac's forces surrendering during the five weeks of fighting starting in January. All officers were executed, though many of the rank-and-file soldiers and warriors were spared. Worse for Warlord Kitana, she would be captured in the final battle, where Toranaga purposely led the forces against her final holdouts. She was not given the opportunity to take up the ritual of seppuku, and she was not executed by the state. Instead, for her rebellion, she was given mercy by the coordinator as she was dragged before the rightful ruler of the Combine. This mercy was a masked insult to both elevate Yori as merciful while punishing Katana indefinitely for her treason. She was sentenced to life imprisonment and has not been seen since. One of the greater tragedies in all this was Karita Emi and her son were found dead in the ruins of the Novacat's capital world. It was found through an autopsy that she and her son had been administered poison and weren't killed in the battle directly. This was likely administered by Emi to her son Daisuki in order to prevent their capture, and a likely worse death at the hands of Loyalist forces. One can't imagine how horrible of a decision she had to make. With their deaths, 
no one remained who could oppose the claim of Karita Yori to the throne. Her place as coordinator was firmly set, and for Tor Naga, he had become more than a power player in combined politics. Toronaga had won the civil war, deposed the weak branch of House Karita, and was still engaged in a war with the Federated Sons, a war he aimed to now win decisively. No leader lasts forever, and the winds of change affect us all. Can you truly tell me that your predecessor would have not attacked us if the possibility had not led to certain destruction? Even your esteemed Harris and Davian would have considered the possibilities. Why else would he have allied so closely with the Raven Khan, perched warily on my border? Winning the war against the Novacats had given the Draconis Combine's mustered soldiery the battlefield experience it needed to increase the competency of its warriors and officers alike. It also gave the Combine the opportunity to feast on the corpse of Clan Novacat, seizing their facilities and weapons for their own usage. There were also the captured soldiers from the Dairon Military District, which could be utilized as a more disposable asset in order for those troops to regain some shred of their honor for the Combine. Recruitment was accelerated even prior to this as the Combine amassed its forces for war, and now the military juggernaut was more primed than ever for the conflict which the Kanri had wanted it for. On the other side of the border, the armed forces of the Federated Sons had achieved all they could. The massive army from the Draconis March had been exhausted, and were either bogged down, tired, in need of fresh troops to relieve them, or they'd just been pushed too far. While they had taken territory and pushed the Combine back, it had been at far too great a price. Now, with the reserves spent, and with a limited advance, Duke Sandoval could do nothing but wait for what he could only have known would have been a hellish reprisal from the now looming dragon beyond the border. In order to try to gain some time for the rest of his formations, in December of 3142, he abandoned the worlds they'd gained from his attack, retreating to friendly territories with a tired, worn army. Two years of warfare had taken their toll, but they had been for almost nothing. In the two years which Duke Sandoval and the Federated Sons government had wasted, Toranaga had turned the Combine into a fighting machine that could slay all that came towards it. His forces were flush with warriors in every branch of the military. Morale was high. Massive logistics programs had been undertaken during the Civil War, and they were paying military and economic dividends now that the war was over. Only three months after Duke Sandoval retired from the field, and near the same time which Warlord Kitana was brought before Ikarita Yori to be sentenced for her treason, the Draconis Combine between March and April of 3143 would launch Toranaga's long-planned assault, the attack that would change the Inner Sphere forever. The offense broke through the Exhausted Sun's line almost immediately, punching through with three quarters of attack into the Draconis Marches. The dragon launched into the war with all of its ferocity, shredding the defenders, either forcing those on the border back immediately or destroying them. But shortly after these corridors opened, the Federated Sons did manage to dig in, their resolve stiffening as the attacks would be rebuffed or ground to a halt, at least temporarily. Corwin Sandoval was by no means a fool. He could see the horror that was unfolding in front of him. With urgency, he would send for aid from New Avalon to his cousin once more, the First Prince. Caleb, unfortunately, saw the situation as being a minor skirmish and deployed a few elements of the Crucius Lancers in hopes of quieting his annoying subject. But this did nothing to help the horrifying realities unfolding within the territories of the Federated Sons. With intense fighting taking place in the theater over the course of several months, it finally came to the attention of the First Prince that his realm was being invaded. The response was one of utter outrage. Caleb's own agenda and his ideas had been for a triumphant conquest of the Capellan Confederation, ironically the strongest military power in the Inner Sphere at the time. 
and he had been massing his energies and efforts towards this single solitary goal. Spending years amassing resources and making plans to emulate the savage blow that was landed in 3028 by his ancestor, Hans Davian. The Draconis Combine was in the process of ruining all he dreamt of. But ambitions for a broad, sweeping victory were not undone by these developments. If Caleb could not have the Capellan Confederation, he would have the Draconis Combine instead. Making plans for a grand attack against New Samarkand, and positioning the Grand Army of the Federated Sons in position to attack. The offensive was planned to not only change the outcome of the war, but to bring Caleb the glory and renown he so sought. He would call upon his Snow Raven allies to attack, using them to shield his forces with their warships as he made his masterstroke to vanquish Toranaga and the Draconis Combine, against armed forces of the Federated Sun's procedures and policies in order to make the attack more powerful he concentrated all of his forces into a single, secret mustering point. The world known as Palmyra. Operation Mandragora would be led by Caleb Davian himself. The First Prince would head a full third of all of the armed forces of the Federated Sons. This was the greatest concentration of Davian forces into a single theater for an assault in anything past the Second Succession War. The attack would begin almost immediately after his Snow Raven allies arrived. The Snow Raven flotilla never departed to join him, and the AFFS would be caught in the single worst military defeat in its history. The site of Palmyra was one of the few worlds whose HPG systems were still working, and as a result, this was an ideal place to muster these forces, as their information would be mostly up to date. The HPG system and other communications were taken down by sabotage before an enormous force of jump ships appeared near a pirate point above the planet and began releasing aerospace fighters. Civilian jump ships with supposedly civilian drop ships, which had already been in orbit, then began to deploy military assets to the surface of the planet at the same time. This was all planned out. The Combine had been tipped off, likely by the Snow Ravens and Toronaga would use the element of surprise and deception to decapitate his adversary. Any Fed Sun forces in space in their jump ships mostly fled the system under the endless assault by fighter assets. And while this did preserve their own forces on board, namely those within the drop ships these vessels were carrying, this act did doom Palmyra's defenders, for no reinforcements or reserves were left in system to support them. The First Prince and his allies were abandoned. On Palmyra itself and in orbit of it, the Fed Sun's arrow assets were driven from the skies in short order. Worst of all, in system, the FSS Lucian, a Davian warship, would be lost in the fighting above the planet in system, failing to withdraw and being utterly destroyed. To the forces below, this was a horrifying event to oversee, like watching a titan being slain before their very eyes. With their fighters destroyed, their dropships destroyed or having fled with their jump ships, and with their warship destroyed, the DCMS now simply turned their own naval assets on any significant gathering of troops on planet that they could find. Thousands were killed shortly after, and forced the AFFS to scatter in order to prevent their wholesale destruction from above. The false civilian ships released whole regiments of DCMS battle mechs into the major cities on planet, namely Jud and Swali, which became primary bridgeheads for the Combine's forces to take the planet. A total of six DCMS regiments would find their way to the surface and would square off against any of the remaining defenders across the surface of Palmyra. Though Caleb, on the surface, had 13 regiments mustered, they were severely depleted after the orbital bombardment. Fighting would break out over the course of weeks as the remnants of these regiments fought the Combine ground forces, who were still supported by significant aerial intelligence and attack assets. While they would fight bravely in their doomed venture to withstand the Combine's attack, inevitably they would be undone. Twelve of thirteen of every soldier who was brought by Caleb to the surface of the planet 
was killed by the end of the conflict, with only a single regiment worth of troops being captured by the Combine. Caleb Davian himself was to be taken alive, though this would ultimately not take place. Caleb, for all of his faults, stubbornly attempted to fight to the death within his marksman tank. His forces were defeated in battle, but no Combine forces seemed willing to engage this vehicle, until he finally landed a critical hit on a Shiro battle mech, which responded by crushing the top of his tank turret. Inside of the wreckage, Caleb would be found dead. Palmyra was the greatest single victory of the Draconis Combine over the Federated Sons in the history of the Succession Wars up until that point. But the end of it, the death of the First Prince, was a blemish which Toronaga would be forced to suffer. To have captured the First Prince would have been to have ended the campaign in essence. Terms could have been more easily forced upon the Federated Sons, as their head of state would have been in their hands. Now the Combine had to fight the Headless Beast, with its core components fighting back wildly, even if they were in a diminished state. It would draw out the conflict and prevent a greater victory yet. Still, Tornaga had done more than almost any other Kanri before him. The crushing of the Novakats and the traitors. The taking of the Draconis Reach. Now, the utter destruction of the AFFS. The dragon had finally had its day, and now it was only a matter of pressing forward to yet more victories to secure the peace and supremacy it would need to remain safe for a hundred years. The power of the Combine would never again be challenged in the Inner Sphere, at least not in Toranaga's mind, and in his vision. The Combine's attack continued to press forward, beginning to roll back the desperate defenders which Duke Corwin Sandoval had put in place. His pleading and begging for aid could now only be received by other March Lords, who either had their own nightmares unfolding, such as the Hassocks and the Capellan Marches, or they were spent, their forces having already been lent to the Mad Prince in the first place. Chaos was unraveling the defenders, and by August, an attack was poised by the Draconis Combine to take the manufacturing juggernaut and capital world of the Draconis Marches, Robinson. On the 23rd of August, the Ryukin and other Combine soldiery units landed on planet and began their assault. The already haggard defenders and the remnants of the Grand Army which the Duke had assembled fought bravely at every level that they could led directly by the Duke himself. Sadly, the battles across Robinson lasted less than a week, and Corwin would be killed in action before the planet fell. Much can be said for his mistakes, but he did have the foresight needed to understand the threat that the Federated Sons faced from the Combine. Had Caleb not been the First Prince, this could have all been avoided. But those are ifs, and the banner of House Karita was raised in victory over the most important world to have ever fallen into their hands since 2791, the last time Robinson fell to the Combine. As this happened, and only then, did the wider news of the First Prince's death begin to permeate around the Inner Sphere. Julian Davian, having been sent on an expeditionary mission to help save the Lyran Commonwealth in the midst of their own collapse, would catch wind of the unbelievable tragedy taking place in his homeland, and the former Prince's Champion would depart to the Federated Sons immediately. He would eventually become the first Prince, and would be forced to face down the catastrophes his realm had suffered. I cannot say what might have occurred but my steps secured my nation from any threats that might strike at it. You lack the military strength to invade us again, and it might be generations before that is no longer true. In 3146, the ultimate humiliation would take place as Toranaga made his bid to force the Davians to come to terms. 
what the first prince did, and no one to, in essence, surrender outside of the stubborn regent of the Federated Sons, Eric Sandoval. Masuhari knew he needed to break the spirit and break the back of his deviant adversaries once and for all. He would do what no others could have hoped to achieve. The Conri would make a play for New Avalon, the capital of the Federated Sons. Victories along a long salient, or bulge, began to expand within the Federated Sons territories on behalf of the dragon, once being called the Palmyra Finger, though now increasingly it was referred to as the dragon's tongue, began to take worlds on a dedicated, vicious path towards the jewel of Davian. July 8th would be when the tongue reached its destination. New Avalon. Outnumbered, tired, beaten, and demoralized forces within the armed forces of the Federated Sons, though capably led by good officers and leaders, simply did not have the power to outfight what they were facing. And truth be told, Toranaga was simply a superior strategist, and when applicable, tactician, to who were currently leading the defense of the Federated Sons. He had outplayed the Sandovals, the Novakats, and the traitorous Katana within his own ranks. And while the Kanri had faced setbacks, and even near annihilation, his understanding of his opponent's strategic and tactical needs informed his own battle plans, and allowed for stunning victories which could mask or overcome the setbacks his enemies delivered to him, either politically or militarily. Air attacks began with the invasion force coming into the system, and once more the AFFS aerospace assets were slowly pushed aside, if only due to the massive losses they'd suffered on their road of defeat so far on the way to their capital world. There were an enormous number of dropships and pocket warships committed to the attack, and with the exhausted resources of the defenders, this meant that the dragon's forces would make landfall on planet the same day of the beginning of the attack. Combine aerospace assets eventually gained the upper hand to such an extent that they were able to run continuous bombing operations for three days to soften up targets for their ground forces to engage. The Wolstergoons, Ryukin, 5th Sword of Light, and 2nd Junotian Regiments all made an enormous push into the AFFS lines in the opening stages of this massive planet-wide assault. These elite formations would make a series of breakthroughs, though the Dragoons would be pulled from frontline service halfway through the campaign to mop up stubborn, encircled, and overrun Davian defenders. Still, for two weeks the Combine scrapped and clawed its way to capturing more and more important strategic infrastructure. The fighting was brutal, and it was hard. Both sides were being bled away by attrition as the defenders attempted to hold out. The new Avalon Crucis March Militia, Davian Assault Guards, and the first Avalon Hussars fought a spirited, vicious defense, but they were simply outmaneuvered by enemy air superiority and by small tactical victories that evolved over time into larger strategic defeats. They would hold in various locations, only for shaping battles to inevitably push them off course. Desperate calls for help were sent out by the defenders through black boxes for relief, begging for any Davian forces to come to stop the slide towards defeat. The Battle of New Avalon would stretch well past weeks, and began to delve into months of fighting. In the tenth week of fighting, demoralized by propaganda distributed by the Combine, claiming that their ally, the Capellan Confederation, had killed their new First Prince, appeared to be in the process of working. Tactical errors on the defenders' part were slowly choking them to death. And while all seemed to be settled, another intervention sought to cut Toronaga's plan short. The second Robson's Rangers arrived off a pirate point and made a desperate rush for New Avalon answering the besieged planet's call for help. They would break through the Combine's shocked aerospace assets, though they lost a third of the Ranger's aerospace assets and a few smaller dropships on the way in. These new defenders, their morale high, bringing with them hopes of further relief and a vengeful fighting spirit, immediately took the battle to the enemy, bloodying the fifth swords and wiping out a full battalion of their formation. 
having caught them by surprise on the Connemara Plains. Counterattacks were made in several key areas, and it truly looked like the tide was beginning to push against the Combine. The Khanri had wanted to avoid using the Dragoons any more than he had to, but now the situation was beginning to look desperate. His own forces were depleted, and the Rangers rallying the defenders would likely stretch the conflict out further. The last thing he wanted were for the Wolf's Dragoons to claim the glory of the Combine for themselves. He would be forced to relent all the same, and unleash the Wolf's Dragoons to confront Robson's Rangers. Heartbreakingly for the defenders, letting the dogs off their leash resulted in a conclusive, crushing defeat for the Rangers within hours of the Dragoons making contact with them. The last hope, the last spark of resistance, vanished in a flash of fire from the mercenaries as they broke the rangers back. The remnants of the rangers would be forced to retreat, and on October 3rd, 3146, the officials on New Avalon made the decision to do the unthinkable. New Avalon could not be held, and its defenders could not hold out much longer. An order to retreat was given to all officials on planet, and an order was given to all remaining forces to attempt to break out and withdraw. This, in and of itself, was a bloody affair, but the remaining AFFS forces would fight to maintain a corridor in the air and on the ground to facilitate their exit. Elements of the Davian Assault Guards would remain on planet to maintain an insurgency, though this wouldn't operate at high levels for the most part. The planet fell into the hands of the Gunji no Kanri, it had fallen into the hands of the Draconis Combine. No other house had ever achieved a victory so grand, despite it costing over three months, and with it being such a bloody affair. Toronaga Masuhari, the Kanri, now stood as one of the most storied figures within the Draconis Combine, if not the most storied figure. He had outdone all of his peers, and he had outdone most of those who dwelt within the histories of the Combine itself. He'd even surpassed his counterparts within other states. It was he, the boy who came from nowhere, who had been a gift to the state by a man who'd given him a second chance at a meaningful life, who had struck this blow to the very heart of the dragon's ancient enemy. He had led the greatest series of campaigns perhaps in the history of the 31st and 32nd centuries by any Inner Sphere commander. His soldiers had dutifully followed his orders, and had received honor themselves for having done so. This was the legacy he had built, no matter whatever else came to pass. Gunji no Kanri Toranaga Masuhari, the slayer of Clan Novakat, the restorer of dignity to the throne the right hand of the coordinator, the conqueror of Robinson, and the slayer of the Duke of the Draconis Marches, First Prince Caleb Davian's executioner, the destroyer of Palmyra and the armed forces of the Federated Sons, and now the conqueror of the only state capital to have ever fallen to another successor state, New Avalon. These were all the accomplishments the Kanri could claim. He had created this vision in his mind decades earlier. He had patience at every step, always planning ahead, and then landing decisive blows where needed. Even as his plans were disrupted or obscured, he never lost his calm or his patience, and would always do what he could to recapture the initiative, both politically and otherwise, as if he were in a wrestling match, constantly attempting to avoid being tossed from his path and using his opponent's energies against them, or their hubris to undo them. The results of the fall of the capital to the planet of New Avalon first and foremost was enormous. All the monuments of House Davian, some of them centuries old, were demolished. Other symbols of the Federated Sons as a whole were torn down, defaced, or otherwise destroyed. More importantly, the New Avalon Institute of Science was put into the hands of the DCMS, who immediately took any and all research and discoveries, advances, or knowledge that they could comb through and sent it back to Luthien, for their own scientists to utilize for further discoveries, and for further weapons developments. This was the greatest prize of all in reality, 
from having secured the prestigious capital of the Federated Sons materially. Many would have expected the forces of the Combine to badly mistreat local populations, though outside of executions of notable religious figures due to fomenting rebellion, for the most part the population was treated with a softer touch. This was by order of the Coordinator, but Toronaga was no fool. Abusing local populations meant more soldiers were needed to restrain them. No rational commander in his position would want that. Upon his victory, Toranaga had cemented his power within the Draconis Combine as well. Who could publicly speak against a man who had given the Combine so much? Even the Coordinator, who was now trying to find allies to her own ends, could not move against him. Toranaga Masuhari was the true defender of the realm, and to the warriors of the DCMS, he had brought them nothing but honor, glory, and the prestige they had always wished for. For citizens, he was a hero, keeping them safe from threats from the outside, the ultimate figure to aspire to, a selfless warrior. Even for the cynical, Toranaga was many things, including a murderous thug, but he was not corrupt. But this high bar would be the furthest he would come, and for every great rise, there must be a great fall. What does it matter now? One way or another, my part in this is over. I will do what I can before leaving this plane, regardless of what you decide. Whether you keep me here to end my days on the world I had subjugated, or send me to atone before the Coordinator, it will all amount to the same in the end. I have served my nation, my people, and my liege. The final chapter is only about the dignity in which I go to my reward. Toranaga looked at Julian carefully, a dark smile creeping across his face again. I am not the one you should be worried about, young prince. The years ahead are only now showing you what comes next. The battles you still have left to fight. I have left your nation weakened. Your resources empty, and your allies in their graves. You will rebuild, but there will be much to do, and much more you cannot expect. The inner sphere I leave will be very different from the one that you will have even mere years from now, and I find myself curious to know how it will be. Perhaps that is my only regret, that I will not live to see what comes next. A barrier of conquered worlds would ring around the tip of the dragon's tongue as Toranaga reinforced his position, but this would be as far as the tongue could extend due to them running into limitations of supply lines. From this point onwards, diplomacy and the broken back of the Federated Sons were his allies. There had to be no alternative for his enemies beyond negotiations. They had suffered humiliation, defeat, and they were now embroiled in a war against both the Capellan Confederation, a more powerful military than that of the Combine, as well as House Carita itself, of course. By all metrics, the war was won. New Sirtis, Robinson, and New Avalon all lay within the hands of the Federated Sun's enemies, three capital worlds within their empire, and three of the most important centers of industry, commerce, and society. Their leadership was new, and the military was depleted. The likely outcome would be a treaty, one which restored New Avalon to the Federated Sons, but at a substantial cost to House Davian and their new First Prince. Instability would reign supreme in the defeated state, and the dragon's borders would swell as other worlds were traded for this gem in the night sky, one which now languished in the dragon's horde until a settlement was reached. 
and if no agreement was met, then the dragon would simply continue its offensive against the ever-depleted, ever-damaged state. In fact, Dracona's High Command would meet with ambassadors from the Capellan Confederation regarding a joint operation, named Tiamat, which would represent a pivot of priority away from the now battered Federated Suns, and towards the dying and withering Republic of the Sphere, with the goal of the two powers to capture Terra, the homeworld of mankind. This diplomatic relationship was mostly approved by Karita Yori, rather than Toranaga. While this took place, Tornaga would find his home within the palace of the Davian royal family, reimagined in his own image. From within, he took time to study the world which was now his seat of power, and the symbol of his conquests. He would take time to embrace the serene surroundings he found himself in, while noting the accomplishments and failures of House Davian itself. His command of the army seemed supreme, and he would engage in the Tiamat Offensive at the request of the High Command, drawing away forces from the occupied territories within the now former Federated Sons. The issue which this created, though, was that Toranaga would rather have seen these forces continue to operate inside of the Davian Theater, but due to the new obligations of their pact and the agreement with Liao, this was no longer in his hands, at least not entirely. The problem was the new leadership of House Davian opted to not capitulate to their Capellan and Combine invaders. It would continue to fight, even at untold cost to the state. Caleb Davian's administration had prior even seemed willing to sign ceasefires with their enemies despite losing key worlds. Near the end of 3147, the first order of business of Toranaga's newest enemy Julian Davian was to disregard these treaties and to spend his nation's wealth in abundance, including sales and bartering of vital state assets and lands to mercenaries, in order to bolster his armies. The armed forces of the Federated Sons, and a huge number of mercenaries, would crash into the Capellan-held territories in the Capellan marches, resulting in recapturing New Certes, though with terrible losses, and the First Prince himself would even lose his leg and several fingers from leading his forces from the front. But they would drive back House Liao and re-establish the Capellan March's capital, liberating their people. This emboldened the Sons to continue to fight even harder, and worse for the Combine, the cessation of hostilities on the Capellan front meant that a larger volume of forces could be redirected into their theater. For Toranaga, worse still, he had been away from Luthien, for too long. He had built up a cadre of officers and generals immediately around him who could be relied on, who were loyal, but his allies on Luthien, the other warlords, and, more importantly, the ISF, had slowly begun to realize his lack of presence within the Combine proper gave them a freer hand to embrace their own ambitions, and seek glories or power for themselves. While he did still have allies abroad, most certainly in New Samarkand, he was finally beginning, by 3149, to see opposition to his policies. The Kanri was no longer the infallible commander. The war had not yet ended with the Federated Sons, and in 3149, Operation Tiamat's attack from the Combine side dragged to a halt due to resistance. Parts of the front needed to be redirected back to the Dragon's Tongue to deal with Operation Perceval, an emboldened, strengthened attempt by the AFFS under Eric Sandoval to drive the Combine out of Federated Sun space. In essence, abandoned by their ally due to their ceasefire with Davian, the Dragon needed to begin its slugging match with the Federated Suns once more. Worse still, Robinson appeared under threat from Operation Euripto, a major attack embarked by the Republic of the Sphere to support their Davian ally. Though reinforcements would be rushed to the planet by Toranaga, by the end of November 3149, one of the two gems he'd taken from the Federated Suns was restored to them by their ally. 
The defense of Robinson had been staged by a multitude of veteran, battle-hardened formations, comprised of various Ryukin regiments, as well as two regiments of the Sword of Light. Even with additional forces flooded into the theater, the Republic committed such an enormous number of troops to this operation that the Draconis Combine, without veteran leadership on planet like Toronaga himself, was unable to hold on, despite fighting as if the Coordinator herself were watching. The Defenders, battered and bruised, would limp off world by November 25th. Robinson was then returned to the Federated Sons officially at this time. However, there would still be an underground war waged by the Draconis Combine's supporters and a few of their remnant military assets. The response from the Combine was not to recoil or to retake the world immediately, but instead was to increase pressure on the Republic to punish it for interfering in the Combine Fed Sun War. The second wave of Operation Tiamat was unleashed upon the Republic. But this was once more a drawing of resources away from the soldiery's reserves to deal with House Davian. At the same time, Toronaga launched a counterattack against Eric Sandoval's forces, taking the world of Kalama in an attempt to slow the assaults on the Dragon's Tongue. And while this did offer a reprieve, it didn't wholly end the offensives being launched repeatedly against the Dragon's Tongue, either in the form of raids or attempted planetary repatriations. Many of these were beaten back by the brave warriors of the Combine, but there were always more mercenaries and more armed forces of the Federated Sons seemingly able to appear elsewhere. The situation was becoming so chaotic in the region that it emboldened Toranaga's enemies and emboldened his one-time puppet. Gunji no Kanri Toranaga Matsuhari was brought before the coordinator, where she gave him a damning overview of the recent handling of the situation within the Combine's new territories and broad border over the last three years. The loss of Robinson had been put at the top of the list, as well as the fact that no outcome to the war seemed in sight, despite the capturing of New Avalon. So great was his failure to use his victories to find political solutions to their problems, she informed him that should the Kanri not stabilize the situation in the Draconis Marches and Dragon's Tongue, then he would be forced to retire and would be sent to a backwater to live out the rest of his days, to contemplate how he had failed to use his great victories for an elevated achievement. In that meeting, Toranaga knew his grip on power had slipped and had done so wholly. While Karita Yuri was still his creature in many senses, he had mentored her and shaped her. She was now too powerful for him to control, and the puppet had cut her strings. Any use she now had for him would be to solidify her own reign and power, her own legacy. While this was not wholly bad, it limited the ability for him to maneuver, especially politically. There were now two masters of the Combine. The dragon was divided once more, even if both sides wholly perhaps wanted similar things. He would succeed and perhaps one day become the uncontested power in the Combine once more. Or he would fail, and so much of what he had worked towards would be for naught. Whether he fell on the battlefield or was forced into an outwardly honorable retirement, one which would have been forced on him to save his dignity after he had lost his fighting edge, rather than having truthfully honored him. In the case of the latter, they would placate him. The crises in the dragon's tongue would appear immediately, however, as in 3151, Toranaga's position would become increasingly perilous on New Avalon. Though he had orders to hold the world, still, he rebuilt his supply lines for resiliency and reorganized his forces protecting the dragon's tongue to better support one another. What had been a shaky wall was turned into a web of steel, interlinking up the chain towards New Avalon and the diminishing number of surrounding worlds. This new strategy did work, and major relief forces were pushed up the chain as well, all aimed at moving towards New Avalon in a counterattack should it come under threat. If no attack came in the coming year, in 3152, new offensives by new forces raised could expand the tongue, while Toranaga still had friends, 
He did not have as many supporters as he once did, and the appetite for endless conflict seemed to be at an end for some of them, including at the very least the director of the ISF, and Karita Yori. In May of 3151, Toronaga realized the Davians were building multiple staging grounds to attack, and they had already probed the system. During a meeting with his staff in attendance, he would be informed that several veteran regiments had been moved from his theater of operation, and they'd been replaced by green forces. Notably though, regiments with no loyalty or affiliation to either him or warlords who supported him openly. And these units were placed further to the base of the neck of the dragon's tongue, making them too many jumps away to be immediately useful should they be needed. This also reduced the hopes of him receiving forces needed for any further counterattacks or attacks against the Davians either, as it was clear forces were being gradually siphoned away from him. One unit would come to his aid though, which had been personally loyal to him, the elite Hikagi formation, which was the only good news he had that day. He was no longer simply playing a game against the first Prince Julian Davian or the Prince's champion Duke Eric Sandoval. Masuhari was playing a game against his own supply base, his own home state. Unfortunately, he could only rely on New Samarkand, and unbeknownst to him, while he had asked for additional supplies and forces from there, his allies on world had been murdered by the ISF, by order of Kurita Yori when he had made his own quiet call for aid. When the battle came to New Avalon, he would find himself broadly without friends. What forces he had in the system, and what forces he had on the ground, were all he could rely on. Every element of the forces he had would be used to their fullest advantage, and all in a bid to buy time to be relieved by other forces in the dragon's tongue. On June 12th, 3151, the Federated Sons were prepared, launching a multi-prong offensive against the tip of the dragon's tongue, with the lion's share of their efforts being placed on New Avalon. Gunji no Kanri Toranaga. This is First Prince Julian Davian of the Federated Sons. You have taken the planet of New Avalon by force of arms in the name of the Traconis Combine and I demand you return it to its rightful owners, the citizens of New Avalon. If your warriors do not lay down their arms and transmit their unconditional surrender by the time my dropships have reached orbit in nine hours, I will be forced to use all military forces at my disposal to liberate New Avalon and return it to them. As for the loyal citizens of the Federated Sons, your prince has returned to you. The transmission was delivered as the fleet entered the system on the date of the attack by its leader, the leader of the Federated Sons. Though Toronaga knew he would not be underestimated by them, they would have no idea of the horrors that laid in wait for them, having taken his time to prepare the planet well to repulse the initial attack. An entire flotilla of assault dropships had been hanging in low orbit around Galahad, they would strike at the invasion fleet, taking them by surprise and cutting into the flanks before any Davian soldiers could even touch the ground of the lost capital world. Thousands died in the vacuum of space as dropships exploded in the void and fighter craft were shot down, or smashed into the hulls of enormous vessels as they were locked on to one another. Despite being outnumbered by the invasion force, these attack ships did their duty, fighting to the bitter end and with fanatical resolve as to prevent the catastrophic reversal of the greatest military achievement in the history of the Combine. But despite their efforts, and efforts of other aerospace Combine assets, the Federated Sons made landfall, specifically under the command of Duke Eric Sandoval. It's important to note that originally the Davians had anticipated making three major landings, but this was made impossible by the level of resistance they faced, and only one major bridgehead would be opened, at least in the beginning stages of the attack. The AFFS also had the objective of not just defeating the Draconis Combine, 
but preserving the industry on planet, which would be vital to the rebuilding of the planet. The armed forces of the Federated Sons themselves, and unfortunately, likely, paying down debts the state had incurred to manage this rebound and pay their mercenary forces. Victory was more complex than just uprooting the Cretan forces. Worse for Sandoval, the harrowing of the Davian forces in space made his victory much harder to achieve. Though the armed forces of the Federated Sons were still notably superior in numbers to their Draconis counterparts. Despite intense fighting, the outnumbered local defenders were careful with their forces, trying their best to not fully invest in fights they couldn't immediately win, especially as the numerical reality of the enemies became clear. The battle would rage from June all the way through to September. This spanned a longer time of battle than it took for the Draconis Combine to take New Avalon in the first place. Battles raged across the planet as regiments of Combine forces desperately held onto every piece of territory they could. Battles raged in cities, forests, and plains. Insurgents made their own moves during this time, attempting to tip the battle in favor of their liberators, and had a meaningful impact on the Combine's ability to defend the world. The reality was the local population was more friendly to the attackers than to the defenders but also still gave a notable morale boost to their enemies, as well as providing them with intelligence data and shelter. Following his own policies and orders, Toranaga did not appear to widely kill civilian populations and did not utterly obliterate local industries, and instead fought a costly, brutal struggle against the planet's attackers. But by September, despite his efforts, the writing had become increasingly clear on the wall to Toranaga. The Davians were not only still materially superior on planet, but still had an element of a reserve. Toranaga had waited for relief, but no reinforcements had appeared, or signaled that they would do so. During this process, even if the world was lost, Toranaga and his command had every intention of confronting and killing Julian Davian on the battlefield, if at all possible. As he entered his Atlas battle mech on September 15th, his thoughts were laid bare in his mind, knowing he fully intended to die fighting alongside his soldiers for a cause greater than himself. It is one of the final things I can do for them, one final service I can render to my nation. A final confrontation loomed with Avalon City, with the dragon only able to muster six companies of Swords of Light 5th Regiment as a defense, to fight against the first Davian's assault guards and the six Cursus Lancers. This would make them outnumbered almost three to one if all units were at full strength. But the ravages of war had forced the Davians to pay their own tithe. But what is certain is they still had superior numbers to the six companies left to defend the capital in the showdown which would take place on September 17th. Tornaga's greatest hope was his planned decapitation strike against the First Prince, or against his champion. Without their leaders, the Davians could be picked apart, as he'd done so before. It was the last thing he could do for his nation. Tornaga would have the Ryukin depart from the planet, as well as the Gene Ocean regiments, before playing his role in the battlefield with the last brave defenders of the planet making their gamble against the Federated Sons as he saw the lines of battle shifting. Toranaga would depart in his atlas. This would be his chosen mount for the battle. My patience is my greatest virtue. My warriors will rendezvous with the others in the dragon's tongue, and we will prepare to strike back at New Avalon. With only the First Prince's damaged task force to face us, it should be easy for us to ultimately retake this planet and end the Davian threat to the Combine once and for all. But Toranaga's mind was not without reservations as to his own chances, or the realization of who had engineered his situation. But his code, the code his father Toranaga Saburo had given him, Bushidu, meant that he would play this role until the very end. The Coordinator has set me up for this final act. 
Without the requested reinforcements, I will not be able to hold the planet. But for now, I will at least make my final mark on this battlefield. During the final engagement, Toronaga would first face down the Prince's Champion in his Axeman. The two meeting as Eric pushed to engage the command of the enemy first. The pair would square off in a duel to the end, with Toronaga in his Atlas battling Sandoval's Axeman. The duel started at close range right away, and unexpectedly Eric almost overwhelmed the Atlas with the sheer ferocity of his assault, and his reckless abandon for his own safety. Toronaga himself every moment of the battle grew to respect the fearsome warrior he had dueled with strategically for so many years now, and it would be impossible to say that the inversion wasn't true as well. This was the truest form of who both of them were. Warriors, both fighting for a cause. Toronaga would eventually come out as the superior, but not before his atlas was badly hindered by the damage done by the prince's champion. But the battle would end with interference from the first prince, Julian Davian, who would fire on Toronaga before he could finish off the downed Axeman. Toronaga, blinded by the attack from clan-level PPCs, could no longer fight, but he could deliver an attack that recognized the bravery of the man he fought and damage the man who had intervened at the last moment, his true enemy. For a long moment there was silence, and then Toronaga's voice came over the same channel. As long as a single warrior of the Combine stands, we will never concede defeat, Prince Davian. However, I acknowledge that you hold the field and I owe it to my warriors to allow them the chance to serve the dragon once more. There was a pause as the Khanri took a deep breath. As such, I yield to the one who has defeated me, Field Marshal Eric Sandoval. Eric straightened in shock as the Atlas awkwardly bowed where it knelt. Field Marshal Sandoval, Toronaga continued, New Avalon is yours. But for you a warning, to take as you will. Never forget that while you lead, others carry out your orders. They are the ones who put their blood, gold, and honor on the line each day for your service. Do not forget who they are, or what they could be. Julian stared at Toronaga for a long moment, and his eyes seemed to glow more defined, as if the milkiness we're leaving them for a moment. Remember this well, Prince Davian. Memento mori. We all must die. But what legacy will you leave behind? Undone. Toranaga was undone by his defeat on New Avalon. All which he'd worked towards. The dream of true, everlasting security for the Combine. His gift to it as his lasting legacy was over. His ambitions to one day rule the Combine itself, in place of Karita Yori, should he have accomplished such a feat, was too dashed on the rocks. His defeat had been a surrender too something which most warriors would have never dreamt of. Fighting to the death would have been expected of him, but he was a true warrior in more than a martial capacity. Toranaga's day was finished, no matter where things came from here, but his survival had been his final weapon against the Federated Sons. And with most of the Combine's best units, outside of the Sword of Light and the Hekage having escaped the planet, he had strengthened the rest of the dragon's tongue, which could either hold out and bleed the Davians further, or fight a bloody, planned retreat against the AFFS. 
It would give them time to fight and win, or time for them to take what they could and make the Federated Sons suffer. But more importantly, the old warrior knew that his surrender had not been anticipated by the First Prince, and it was certainly not expected or wanted that he would have surrendered to the First Prince's champion. He gave the credit of the liberation of New Avalon to the one he believed most deserving. That was true. But in doing so, he still delivered a deadly cut against the First Prince. Better yet, he knew his surrender and incarceration only further complicated Davian's position. If the roles had been reversed, there would have been little complication in the Combine. But not in the Federated Sons. He was set up to be put before a military tribunal, but there were calls to send him back to the Draconis Combine, or even just to drag him out and shoot him. Returning him to the Combine made the prince look weak. Killing him out of hand made him look spiteful. Putting him on trial before a tribunal, perhaps most appropriately, made him appear uncaring to the wants of the populace. Nothing would play well with everyone. But he had one more play to make. His final request. Because Toronaga, now in his cell, would request to be allowed to end his own life through seppuku. And this was done sincerely, allowing for him to pass from one life to the next with honor. And he genuinely wished for the man who defeated him, Duke Eric Sandoval, the prince's champion of the Federated Sons, to be his second in the ritual. Again, the truth of it was pronged. For Toronaga, he would honor Eric, and be honored by Eric, by doing the ritual. But it would also further enhance Sandoval's reputation. It allowed him to pay his respects and be respected in turn, all while wounding the Federated Sons and its leader yet more. The request became to some degree public, at least amongst the military, and gossip helped spread it afar from there. This put the First Prince in an even worse bind, as now another option was on the table, and one which made Julian appear to be even less of the liberator of New Avalon and the man who defeated the dragon. From within his cell, now simply Toranaga Masuhari, would look with his half-blinded eyes at a screen depicting the beautiful view he had experienced from the palace for several years in his meditations, and was now doing so again from his cell, seeking peace, serenity, strength, calmness, and closure. He would be intruded on by the man who ruled the nation which had defeated him, the one which Toranaga had now outplayed in his defeat. Julian would start by simply asking questions, to which Toranaga answered them, in some cases giving advice even, and in other ways manipulating the conversation to his own ends. But he had his admissions. Discussion of failure, lost opportunities, respect, and the future all came to light. Though at the end, Toranaga would remind the prince of his mortality and of his legacy. Legacy was the thing Toranaga cared for most in life at this point. For all of his plans, for all of his campaigns, it'd always come down to legacy. What kind of world would he leave behind? How would he be remembered? Toranaga had no family to pass this legacy to, only the state. He came from nowhere and would return to nowhere. He never married a woman, as his preferences did not align with that, and he had no children, adopted or biological. He had no long-term partners either, having lived a solitary life, only with allies, perhaps with a few friends to carry on his banner, but little else. Toronaga Masuhari, son of Toronaga Suburo, was a warrior of the Draconis Combine. It was all he could have been, and only his actions would be what were left behind. Whether that be he was sent to the Combine and faced execution, or a quiet life on a distant world, or he faced imprisonment and execution in the Federated Sons. But it was these words, the last words, which determined his fate, and the fate of Prince Julian Davian. Remember this well, Prince Davian. Memento mori. We all must die. But what legacy will you leave behind? He broke out into laughter afterwards. It echoed around the small cell which he sat in as the prince watched on. 
Supposedly, Hernstavian felt pity, but truthfully Julian interpreted it as a call for death from the now former Canri. Out of pity, he would draw his weapon without thinking. But I suspect he pulled the trigger out of frustration, and the realization that despite Toranaga being defeated on the battlefield, that the soldier had in many ways won. Toranaga's victories had changed the inner sphere. They had badly crippled the Federated Sons. They had helped push the Republic of the Sphere into its grave. They had empowered the Draconis Combine, which was now still stronger from his rule than it had been before, and would continue to be so for decades into the future. He had changed the DCMS, the Combine, and the Federated Sons forever. And unknown to Julian Davian, his death in his cell, shot as a defenseless prisoner of war by the First Prince, was the seeds of yet another victory. Strength wanes. Beauty fades. Life gives way to death's decay. Legacy lives on. What a ride. <laughs> uh, when I'd originally started the script, I thought it'd be like a 30 minute video, but as I delved further and further into the subject matter, I became more engrossed. I tried my best to bring everything we see from the source books to life, all while utilizing the latest novel Damocles sanctioned for quotes and for Toranaga's final act. I originally just wanted to make the video as a precursor to Dominions Divided coming out, even just to give people some idea of why it mattered so much. Then Damocles Sanction came out, and we learned so much more. I went down the rabbit hole. Many fans, even fans from the Ill Clan era, really don't know much about Toranaga, and perhaps not much about the Draconis Combine during this time. But truth be told, Toranaga is the most important character, in my view, to participate in the Dark Age era, and is one of the best characters out of Battletech as a whole. I thought it was interesting on how his life came together, who he was, as well as what motivated him inevitably. He's the best commander in the Combine's history, perhaps even more so than Karita Theodore, and he came from nowhere. He was just a boy on the streets who was given a chance. His origins frame his life. His love of country is sincere, and while he wished for his own advancement, it was always through the lens of honor that his adopted father had taught him. Inevitably, Toranaga just wanted what was best for the Combine in the end. More fascinatingly too, even on New Avalon, had Toranaga the forces he asked for, which were available, he would have held the world and defeated Julian's attack. I checked with a few folks too, and yes, Toranaga is a superior tactician, strategist, and politician to Julian. He just had people looking to shut him down back home, and you can only fight on so many fronts, with so many forces. It truly wasn't the Federated Sons who defeated him but those in the Combine who wanted to move past his leadership. Those who saw the war with the Davians as just being a never-ending entanglement. They probably weren't wrong, but without their intervention, Toranaga would still likely be on New Avalon, and Julian and Eric would be in retreat or finished. The Conri was the best commander the Inner Sphere had to offer at this time. His passing may have altered Karita's politics, but it also means that the strongest military leader in the entirety of the Inner Sphere now has been removed from the board just as the Ill Clan era is getting started. This is my first major character piece I should add, and it's also really my first major Dark Age-centric video that I've done, so I hope everybody enjoyed. I also used a series of audio tracks for this video, which I was given permission to use through license from Audacious Cues. I've put a link to his YouTube page in the description below. It's a fantastic series of tracks, and I think you'll enjoy them and you should check them out. I will also include a link to his Bandcamp if you want to support him. I thought this stuff was amazing, which was why I was very happy to get this for the video, and for future Draconis Combine videos at that. 
I will also include links to all of the primary resources from sourcebooks that I use to craft this video. And with that, thank you for joining me here today. As you can probably guess, if you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting like and subscribing. It really does help out the channel immensely when you do that, I promise. From those who enjoy the work even more though, have you considered becoming a channel member? Channel memberships are the main thing that allow me to create crazy video projects like this one. And I can't thank you enough, for real. Because videos like this are really only made possible by viewers like you. And with that, I'd love to hear what you think of the Combine in this period, and perhaps the Federated Sons, or the Kanri himself. I hope to catch you all in the comment section below.